Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Don't ever be afraid to ask God for anything that you want to need. John 14, 12 through 14. John 15, 7 and 8. John 15, 16. <laughs> John 16, 23 and 24, John 16, 26 and 27, they all say, ask for whatever you need and I'll do it. What wild promises. Now, obviously, you can't just pull one scripture out with having them all and there are other scriptures that say we need to pray according to the will of God. So we want the whole counsel of the word of God, but I sure don't want you to be afraid that you're not going to pray in the will of God, so afraid that you don't pray. So I suggest that while you're learning to know more and more and more about God, that you just be bold and aggressive in your prayers, just saying to God, if it's not your will for me, don't give it to me. I don't want anything that you don't want me to have. If we could get to that point where we could say, God, I don't want anything you don't want me to have. You know, in John chapter 15, Jesus said, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, you can ask what you will and I'll do it. And I used to just shake my head at that. How could God say, you ask me for whatever you want and I'll do it because I already knew that some of the stuff I was asking for probably wasn't right. But see, there's a little secret in there. He says, if you abide in me, and that means live, dwell, and remain. God has not called us to a Sunday morning visit. <laughs> Hello? He doesn't want to live in the Sunday morning box in your heart. He wants to get into Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. How you dress, what you eat, who you hang out with, what you watch on television. So that's kind of what it means to abide in him. If you abide in me, and then he says, if my word abides in you. So if I'm meditating on the word and I know the word and the word is my life well sure if I've got that kind of relationship with him and his words and me all the time I'm not going to ask for anything that's not God's will <laughs> so while you're on your way while you're growing don't be afraid to ask God but if you don't get it don't get upset and don't be jealous of somebody else who has what you wanted because guess what we all have an individual, personalized plan with God for our lives. So ask, ask, ask. And then in the Amplified Bible, and I love this, when it says, ask in my name, you know, we are to pray in Jesus' name, to the Father, through the Holy Spirit, when you say in Jesus' name, it's not like a little magic charm that we tack onto the end of all of our prayers. But when I say in Jesus' name, what I'm actually saying, Father, I'm presenting to you everything that Jesus is. That's the amplified translation. When you pray in my name, that is presenting all to the Father that Jesus is. So thank God we don't go and present what we are. We would never get anything. We pray in his name. In his name. So the first thing is, is we need to learn that we can pray anytime, anywhere. Learn to pray our way through the day. Prayer is a privilege, not an obligation. And we miss a great deal in life just because of a failure to get God involved in it. Open up the door and get God involved in everything just by asking him. Acknowledge God in all your ways and he will direct your path. Keep prayer simple. We're more likely to pray often if we believe it can be short and simple. Matthew 6, 7 says, and when you pray, don't heap up phrases, multiplying words, repeating the same ones over and over as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their much speaking. <laughs> it's hard for the flesh to believe that a short, simple little prayer Jesus, mommy, ouchie, <laughs> can be answered. Be sincere when you pray. The earnest, heart, earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available. And it's working. 
Realize that you're speaking to God when you pray and stay focused. Satan will try to distract you when you try to pray. And I don't know about you, but all the little dings and beeps and stuff, it's hard to ignore them. You got to at least go. Okay, here's another thing that's very important if you want your prayers to be answered. Don't hold a grudge against anybody. Now, some of you probably don't want to talk about this this morning, but we're going to anyway. Who are you mad at today? You know what? Staying mad at somebody is not going to change them one iota. But if you stay angry, it will change you. It'll make you bitter and give you a headache, make your stomach hurt. What does the Bible say in Ephesians 4? Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't give the devil any such foothold in your life. If you give him a foothold, then he's likely to get a stronghold. Why do you think the devil works so hard to get us against each other? How many opportunities do you think you have every week to be offended? It's a great thing for a person to ignore an offense and say, I'm going to believe the best. I'm not going to let the devil get me again. And of course, you know, then there's always a, well, you don't know what's happened to me in my life. Well, no, you're, you're right. I don't, but I do know what happened to me. And I know what's happened to a lot of other people. And I do know what the Bible says and Everything that God tells us is for us. It's not for anybody else. It's for us. <laughs> Holding a grudge against someone will definitely affect prayer and not in a good way. Matthew 6, 14 says, For if you forgive people their trespasses, their reckless and willful sins. So these are not even things that they did accidentally. He's saying, even if somebody hurt you on purpose, they willfully hurt you. You leave the situation, let it go, give up the resentment. <laughs> and can I just say that when you're angry with somebody, the quicker you let it go, the easier it is to do. Always do it before it has time to get down inside you and take root. And then your heavenly Father will also forgive you. You see, the one important thing about prayer, when we go to God, we've got to have confidence that there's nothing between us and God to the best of our knowledge. Something that I suggest doing is at night when you lay down, just ask yourself before you go to sleep, am I mad at anybody? God, am I mad at anybody? <laughs> if you fall asleep too fast, when you wake up the next morning, ask yourself, now, God, am I mad at anybody? Get to the point where you refuse to go to, go to sleep or to go out of your house mad at anybody. One more scripture here. For this reason, I'm telling you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe, trust, and be confident that it is granted to you and you will get it. Now that, you know, man, that's about a four-part series right there. So what's he saying? You ask for it, you believe in the spirit that you got it, and then you will get it. You see that? First comes faith, then comes sight. First you believe, then you see. In our society, we say, well, I'm not going to believe it if I don't see it. But in God's economy, we have to learn how to live the exact opposite. If it's in the Word, if it's the will of God, if I ask God for it, I believe that He's sending it and that I will get it, and I'm going to stay firm in my faith until I see that manifestation. <laughs> this is what faith is. Faith is a title deed, the proof of the things that we do not see that we hope to obtain. And we have it first by faith. Dave and I signed a contract last week with an architect who's going to design something for us, and we made a down payment. Now, I fully, without any doubt, expect that woman to come up with the plans. But I haven't seen them. I haven't even seen her work. I've heard about her reputation. <laughs> the whole 
Holy Spirit is our down payment, the Bible says. Come on. The Holy Spirit, just that, yeah. You know, you're sitting out here today, maybe you've never heard anything like this, but boy, it feels good inside. You're like, man, could I dare believe this, that I could have that kind of power in my life, that I could go to God Almighty and ask him for anything and everything, and he cares enough about me that he wants to get involved in my life. Can I dare believe that? The down payment of the Holy Spirit is that little thing floating around inside of you that in your heart is saying, yes, yes, even though your head might be saying, no, no. I tell you, the first time I went into a service like this where people were clapping and shouting and cheering and jumping up and down, I mean, everything in my legalistic, indoctrinated religious brain said, <laughs> I mean, I even looked and one guy was walking around, had no shoes on. And I thought, he is barefoot. Now, I'm still not real fond of that in church, but you know, God did tell Moses to take his shoes off, so I don't know. Oh, give me a break. <laughs> we think that somebody can't be from God if they've got a tattoo. We think somebody can't be from God if they don't have the right hairstyle. We think somebody can't be from God. And a lot of times, we're so busy trying to clean the fish, we haven't even caught it yet. <laughs> Me and a friend of mine who was a, who's a real, true evangelist, we went into this shop one day to shop, and the lady said, what are you doing here? And we said, well, we're here for, you know, a Christian Bible seminar. And she said, oh, I'm spiritual too. Well, you know, I'm... You know when somebody says that, you're kind of like, mm, well, what does that mean? I'm spiritual too. <laughs> and uh, so we didn't, you know, we didn't get into that too much. But then she, she proceeds to talk about God for a little bit and her version of God. And then all of a sudden she blurts out this real pretty serious cuss word. I mean, you know, it was like one of the big ones. <laughs> Even that, we've divided up into big and little. <laughs> you know, of course, I was a little, but the evangelist just leaned in. <laughs> and uh, so then this girl, this spiritual girl, she said, oh, I'm sorry I cussed, but she said, you know what? I think God cusses once in a while. <laughs> okay, see, you're like I was. <laughs> you're not ready to fish yet. And so I lean right across that counter, and I said, God does not cuss. I'm defending God's honor. God does not cuss. And my evangelist friend slips around on this side and leans in, and she says, but he sure loves people that do. trying to clean that fish and we hadn't even caught it yet. <laughs> it's so good for us to learn to stop getting our nose out of joint if everybody's not like us. If they don't look like us and smell like us and talk like us and dress like us and worship like us. And there are so many grudges in the body of Christ at large. Come on, you know, this denomination don't like that denomination, that denomination don't like this denomination. <laughs> you know, there's probably even some churches in town, I don't know, maybe it doesn't happen everywhere, but somewhere where maybe, you know, the church was told, don't you go to that Joyce Meyer meeting. Because, <laughs> you know, she is whatever I am. And that's such a shame when we do that. Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that it's granted to you and you will 
get it. When I walked into that first meeting that was kind of similar to this, my religious brain was going, no way. But my heart was like, yes, yes, yes. That confirmation you have in your heart that God is working and that you will see some. Can I tell you something? Whatever kind of problem you've got now, I don't care what it is and you hold on to this, it's going to work out okay in the end. Come on, in the end, it's all going to come around and be right. In the end. You know, there's so much stuff going on in the world today, and people ask me frequently as a minister, well, what do you think about what's going on in the world? And, you know, sometimes you don't know what to think, and I'm certainly not going to live in fear. I believe God's going to take care of us. And, but I was reading Psalm 37 a month or so ago, and it says so plainly, do not fret yourself over the evildoers, <laughs> for they will soon be cut down like the grass. The meek in the end will inherit the earth in the end. Amen. And the good news is, is we already know how it ends because we've got the book. Man, we've been from Genesis to Revelation today. <laughs> so don't let all those grudges stay in your heart. Angry about this, angry about that, angry about something else. Don't hide sin in your heart and expect your prayers to be powerful. Psalm 66, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. 1 John 1, 9, but if we freely admit that we've sinned and confess our sins, which basically means just to acknowledge them, to agree with God. This morning when the Holy Spirit prompted me that putting shaving cream on Dave's dessert was not a good idea, <laughs> I agreed with him. That probably would not be a good idea. <laughs> How many of you know some of the stuff you come up with You've already got that little inkling, this ain't a good idea. <laughs> Some of you even got married knowing this ain't a good idea. <laughs> Lord, help us. He is faithful and just and will forgive our sins, dismiss our lawlessness, and continuously cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I love 1 John 2. You have to look at this. My little children, I write all of these things to you that you may not sin. This is the whole purpose of the book. Don't live in sin. Don't hide your sin. Bring it out in the open because the only things that the devil can hold over you are the things that are hidden in darkness. I don't know, man, if you used to be a prostitute and you're hiding that because of fear of what everybody would think, find somebody you can trust and tell it. If you can't tell anybody else, write me and tell me. But the only things that the enemy can hold over us are things that we hide. But if you continue in my word, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. I stood in the pulpit last Sunday at our church in St. Louis. We've got a church in the inner city. Beautiful church. And um, I only get to preach there a handful of times a year, but I stood in the pulpit and told them how I used to be a thief and a liar. And see, they responded about the way you are. <laughs> like, well. What am I supposed, how do I process that information? <laughs> because that person who did that is dead. Yeah. And I'm a new creature in Christ. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, you want to talk about some of the stuff you did?
But see, it does not bother me one iota to stand up here and not only tell you that, but now the whole world knows it. Or everybody who's listening, that's not the whole world, but whoever's out there that's listening, now they know. But you notice I said, I used to be. I once was. You know, the person who was sexually abused by her father for 15 years died in Christ. That's why I can't be a victim of anything. You cannot be a victim when you've got the victory. I can talk, when I talk about that girl, that's like somebody I used to know way, way long time ago. And see, that's part of the problem we have is people don't know how to let go of the old and take hold of the new. I love this. But if anyone should sin, we have an advocate, one who will intercede for us with the Father, and that's Jesus Christ, the all-righteous, who conforms to the Father's will in every purpose, thought, and action. It almost sounds to me like he's saying, you know what? It's so easy to take care of sin <laughs> that it really doesn't have to be a major problem. Get up every day and do your best not to sin. That's our goal. <laughs> you didn't come here this morning because you're intent on sinning. <laughs> and so therefore, I can boldly say to you, when you do, you don't have to worry about it. You do need to acknowledge it. But here's the good news too. Hey, if you die and you forget to confess some stuff, that's not gonna keep you out of heaven. <laughs> God knows your heart. But when the Holy Spirit does convict you of something, then that's the time to say, God, you're right. Don't ever argue with God, it is pointless. <laughs> he always wins. No matter who you are or what you've done in life or what you may need, you can talk to God about it. And that's what we call prayer. God's Word says that we are to ask. So simple and yet so powerful. Mark 11, 24 says this, For this reason I'm telling you whatever you ask for in prayer, believe, trust, and be confident that it is granted to you and you will get it. Well, first of all, I was rescued from spiritual death and from physical death. And I really feel that I've been rescued. Rusland heeft een drastische economische crisis doorgemaakt. Alexei was net elf jaar oud en de honger dreef hem de straat op. First, I joined a bad company. This is how I learned to smoke, to drink alcohol, and uh, doing lots of other bad things. Uh, I didn't join this company of friends, you know, just in order to drink alcohol or to smoke, but there was another reason. Uh, my mother was uh, a single mother, and we were two children in her family. I had to beg for money for food because my mother did not have enough money to feed us. Toen hij op straat leefde, had Alexei geen andere keuze dan te overleven. Hij kon de rauwe realiteit alleen aan door te vluchten in drugsgebruik. Er was een vrouw, haar naam was Lilith. En op dat moment dacht ik niet dat mijn my life was wrong. En toen Lilith me invited me to come to their home, I joined the House of Mercy en ik stayed daar. Ze really cared for us, ze fed us. And there is a rule for those who stay in the House of Mercy that you have to go to church. <laughs> Once when I was visiting church, uh, there were ushers standing by the doors. And one of the ushers told me, God is waiting for you today. And uh, this was important for me. I'm thankful to God that he gave me enough wisdom so I make the right decision. 
and I really feel that I've been rescued. It's been a blessing to see uh, a miracle that God's done in his life, how a previous drug addict is now serving in church, is now helping me to minister to other people, and helping me to prepare for church services on a weekly basis. The point of my life today is to follow Christ and to become better and better each day and uh, become a real disciple of Christ. En nu, let op. Geloof, liefde, hoop. Stop letting the disappointments of your past dictate your future. Get your hopes up and see what God can do. Durf te hopen. Dit boek zal je inspireren en enthousiast maken. Je mag iets goeds verwachten, omdat God goed is. Bestel nu het boek via internet bij joy-meyer.nl of bel 026 2022 100. Joyce Meyer is toch van tv? Wat doet ze nog meer? Ze schrijft boeken. Er zijn ook dvd's, themaboekjes, mokken. Hé, hey, dat kan ik allemaal niet onthouden. Daarom is er de Joyce Meyer info- en productbrochure. Die kan je kosteloos bestellen. Online of telefonisch. Super!